All right. Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? I want to say hello to those watching online. Welcome to uh, God's house for those online and those here. Um, it is already 1120, so I promise not to keep you too long. Um, and so what I want to say at the beginning here is that what we had planned for today was to give a presentation for you guys about our building, because we're in the middle of restoring our building. Uh, but we're going to wait until uh, either next week or the week after to do that so we have more time, because we worshiped for like 45 minutes, and there is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So I just want to say at the beginning before I get in here uh, to the Bible, because I always have messages that God has in my heart, so don't worry, I got something to say. But um, I just want to say thank you to our worship team and to Anthony uh, specifically this morning, because what you guys don't know is that behind the scenes, we're always trying to listen to what God is saying about a Sunday morning. And the way that they started worship today was not the plan. It actually ended up being backwards to how the schedule was, right? And um, Caleb came up to me about five minutes before service and said, I feel like we need to reverse worship. And I said, okay, which is hard for me because I don't want you all to come in here and think like, it's got to be quiet, you know? Like, I want people to come in and be like, yeah, I'm here, and then go to the quiet. And I'm just, it's a pastor thing, I guess. And so I was just like, do what you got to do. And then it was awesome to watch how the Holy Spirit moves and works in all of our lives. So thank you guys for your obedience. The Bible says that obedience is better, yeah, better than sacrifice. And Anthony Iyer, you just need to stop saying that you don't do well on the platform. <laughs> and I'll leave it there. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. James is the, my favorite book of the Bible. We're going to talk this morning uh, about a topic that I uh, don't like to talk about. But when, when Tim came up to me and said, I think we should wait for the presentation part, I thought, I, I think we should too. And I said, I don't know what to say. And then I was like, the Holy Spirit said, yes, you do. So I had this message on my heart all week, and I guess it's for all of you. So I apologize. It's for you. We're going to talk this morning uh, on the topic of choosing sin or not. Mm, mm. Here we go. You just blame Jesus if you don't like it. James chapter 1, starting in verse 13, it says, When tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by their own evil desire they're dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Let's pray together this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way you move in our midst when we come together and just open our hearts to you. I thank you for what was started in here an hour ago, and I pray now, Lord, that you who began a good work would carry it on to completion, that if there's anything in any of our hearts this morning that we need to let go, that we need to repent of, that we need to say, God, I will turn the other way, that you will give us the strength and the grace to do that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the book of James because if you had to take the entire Bible away and you only could pick one book, I would totally pick the book of James because James can summarize all of the Bible. Like James can bring together the entire Bible and the entire gospel and what it comes down to. Now, it's interesting in the book of James, he doesn't talk much about Jesus. And you're like, well, then how can he talk about the gospel? He, he talks about what comes out of and from the gospel and how we live it out in our everyday life. And James is talking here, the book of James is addressed to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. In other words, I don't have time this morning to go all in the backstory of James, but James was either the brother of Jesus or one of the disciples of Christ. We don't know for sure, but it's, it's speculated he was probably the brother of Jesus. And so this guy spent more time with Jesus than a lot of the writers of the Bible. The Apostle Paul wrote, wrote more than half of the New Testament, and he didn't spend time with Jesus. He came after Jesus. And so James is a guy who's got firsthand information from Jesus. That's pretty cool, right? Like he hung out with this guy. He was with this guy on the weekends. He was with him at church. He was with him at the ball game. Okay, or the, what did they play back then? I don't even know. 
I'm just going to stop. But he hung out with Jesus, and however they hung out, rode their donkeys together, I don't know, dug water from a well, whatever they did for fun. Thank God I was born in 1985, and, and when there's cars in Evian. Okay, so James had time with Jesus. And so when James is writing, where he's writing from is this, is this posture of knowing the heart of God in such a way that he's like, man, I'm writing this to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. At this point, they've been scattered everywhere. In the Old Testament, they were together. And then at times, they separated and they fought. And there was all this drama. And, and, and so James is saying, I'm addressing all of it. And so if you look at James in today's age, James is saying, look, this is for everybody. This is not just a message to those who come to church. This is not just a message to those who don't like church. This is not just a message to whatever, fill in the blank. This message is for everybody. And so he starts out the book of James and he says at, in verse 2, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of any kind. I don't know about you, but I don't typically experience joy when I'm in the midst of a trial, right? But he starts his book in this place because he wants to build a foundation that the joy of the Lord should be your strength. That who God is in you is greater than what you're facing. And so he starts from the beginning of the book of James and starts talking about trials. Then he goes in and says, if you need wisdom, ask God for wisdom. And then he says, have faith. And if you don't have faith and you doubt, you're just like the wave of the winds tossing back and forth. There are so many sermon series out of the first chapter of James that we could talk about this morning. But I'm getting to sin in just a minute. And then he goes and he looks at us and he says, blessed are you who persevere under trial because when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life. When you have stood the test, what is the test that we have to stand in? Life. All the things that life throws at us, when our faith is high, when our faith is low, when we're questioning everything around us, when we're in times where we're just like, God, you're so amazing, and when we're in times where we're like, God, are you even there? He says, when you persevere through all that, you've stood the test, and you'll receive the crown of life. And then he goes into verse 13 through 18, we read this morning, and he says, now, now I'm going to give you a little bit of correction, all right? You got to withstand, you got to do all this. Now I'm going to talk to you about what you're doing in your life and the temptation that you are telling yourself that you continue to run back to. Can I take a break just for a minute? Can you guys just one moment? Anthony, could you grab me the whiteboard, bro? Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm back. So he says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. Such an interesting verse. Because I don't know about you, but if we were to go around this room and say, here's my struggle, right? Here's the thing that I struggle with. And you might be your first time in church. You might have grown up in church. But it does, you don't have to look too far in your life to know this is the struggle that I have, right? And so he says, when you're in that place of struggle where you want to separate yourself from God, because sin is simply a separation from God, it's missing the mark. It's like you have this bullseye. Thank you, sir. In fact, look at that's perfect. Now I can illustrate it. It's like you have this bullseye, right? Don't judge my artistic ability. And here's what happens in our life is we get into these struggles, we get into these trials, we're trying to stand the test, and we shoot the arrows of our life and they land over here or here or here or here. This is not a representation of God's love is like right here. God's love is all-encompassing. It won't fit on the whiteboard. Your sin is not a representation of God's lack of love, okay? I want, I want you to know that this morning. When you talk about a topic like this, some people approach it and are like, if you're in sin, you're just going to hell. Well, then we're all going to hell. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm not trying to get theological here and talk. You know, I know different theologies think you can get to the point where you don't sin, but I can't believe that theology because I haven't got there yet. I don't know that you can ever arrive at a place... I'm going to get a letter. I don't know that you can ever arrive at a place where you don't sin. I know I'm stepping on some theology, especially in the town we're in. I'm very aware. I've studied a lot of theologies. I don't think, personally, though, you can arrive at the place where you just don't sin. The only person that ever didn't sin was Jesus Christ who walked on the earth fully God and fully man. And the reason he didn't sin was because he was fully God. 
Now, Mark talks about how we can be little gods, and there's another theological thing that I get a letter on. I'm not talking about you're a god and I'll worship you, but, but we're little gods, we're representations of Christ, right? And so when Christ comes into our lives, he consumes every part of us, but it doesn't denote the fact that we're still human, and we will still mess up, and we'll still miss the mark and run towards sin. So James says, when you're tempted, don't blame God for the temptation. Anybody ever done that? Lord, if you just would have convicted me more, I wouldn't have had that second pie yesterday. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> then I woke up this morning, I turned on my Bible app. I know, Mr. Trainer. I turned on my Bible app and I opened it up and it said, have you not heard your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm like, well, God, you could have told me not to. And James is like, no, no, no. That wasn't God's fault, buddy. That's your lack of self-control. But it was some good pie. So... When tempted, don't say that God is the one tempting me because why? God cannot be tempted by evil. Man, that's a big scary word, evil, right? We're like, oh, evil. Here's what I think James is getting at for you. I don't want, this is not, whenever you talk about things like sin, this is not to scare you. It's to say grace is so much greater. But what he's saying is like God, God doesn't even touch things that aren't of him, right? He's not, it's not that he won't touch you if you're not of him because you're his, you're his child, like Genesis 1, he created you in the image of God. So it's not that God won't touch you, but he doesn't touch the sin issue because he's God and he doesn't have to. So he's not going to tempt you with something he doesn't have to have. He's not going to tempt you with something that he can't have because he is holy and he's blameless and he can't look on sin. But, verse 14 says, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed and then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Go over to 2 Samuel and look at chapter 11. Then I'm going to write some things on the board and we can go home, I promise, all right? Or head on down to Country Cafe and support them and support us. Yeah. And while you're turning there, aren't our new steps out front really awesome? We'll talk more about that in the next couple of weeks. What's that? Second Samuel chapter 11. I want to illustrate what James is saying here in the story of King David and Bathsheba. Starting, uh -huh. Starting in verse 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. Reba, huh? I don't know that word. Anyways, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me to Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, or how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and had a gift from the king and was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to this house. When David was told Uriah did not go down or go home, that he asked him, haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped out in open fields. How can I go home and, exit, or, and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, will not, I will not do such a thing. And then David said to him, stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line 
where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him, and he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. The men of the city came out and fought against Joab. Some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Now this story has got so much in it. And I want to finish this up in 10 minutes, so just bear with me, all right? But this is so good. So David, who is the anointed king of Israel, right? David, who is the man after God's own heart. David is the man who's been crowned king, who fought Goliath with a stone and killed him. David, who's like, who's torn the jaws of beast. This David, who is the mighty warrior, had some issues in his life with sin. How crazy is that? Here is this story about David and his cycle of choosing sin. Watch how it unfolds. David, as we started in verse chapter one, first off is walking around on the roof of his house, which to us seems like, I don't know, I don't walk around on my roof because it's like this, and that would not be cool. And so, but in, but in their culture, the roofs were flat, and they're walking around on the roof, but they also, because he was the king, would have lived way up here, and the people below him would live down this way. And so when he's on his roof, he can look down to other roofs. And so as David is on his roof, king of the Israel, looking over his people, oh, by the way, I missed this part, while he should have been out fighting with his men. I forgot that whole part. See, this is when you don't have notes, you forget things. Okay, so he should have been out fighting with his men. So David, the warrior, David, the king, David, the leader of his army, sends his men out to battle, number one wrong thing he did, and then stays home and then begins to see a a woman bathing down there. Instead of being like, oh, that might be someone else's wife, I should probably look away. He's like, shoot, dang girl. (laughs) And when you got power, what are three things that will ruin you? Money, sex, and power, right? When you got power, you just send your people to go get her and bring her to you. And so instead of being out on the front lines of the war and fighting the battle like he should have, he lets desire overtake him and in that moment gives birth to sin because the sin comes into his life when he comes and sleeps with Bathsheba, who's not his wife, and she's the wife of a man who's fighting for him. Do you see how twisted this is? We could literally make money if we just made TV shows about the Bible. Not like the the ones that are all with the big music and the, you know, everybody's on, I mean, like you could make a reality show about these stories. It's crazy. And so he's at home and he sends for her and he sleeps with her and then he wakes up the next morning and, and, and whenever, you know, like, I want to do a message sometime called The Morning After. We are like, oh, Jesus, what happened yesterday? He's probably, you know, ashamed. Because he knows, he knows. One, he shouldn't have been looking at her. Two, he shouldn't have slept with her. And three, he should be out fighting. He's not stupid. He's the king, right? And he's like, oh, shoot. Okay, I really screwed up. So how am I going to fix this? And how many times do we do that with sin issues in our life, Right? We're like, oh man, oh man, I, I, I messed that thing up. And so instead of running to the altar and saying, God, forgive me, oh my gosh, like I'll make it right. We're like, okay, how can I make sure no one else finds out? Oh, I know, I'll bring Uriah home and then he'll sleep with his wife and they'll think it's his kid. Now what's interesting, they don't say this in the story, but I always wonder is, I, David was, was I, I've heard a lot of historians say David was probably a redhead, which I think is great. I don't know if he went bald or not, but, but that was very rare. And so Uriah probably looked a lot different than David because he was a Hittite. David was an Israelite, right? Track with me here. So his mind that has been given in to desire and temptation trying to like, I'll fix this myself. It's so stupid because if he had slept with his wife and the baby came out of redhead, you'd be like, uh, I'm that, mm, hmm, right? But see, when you're in a tangled web of trying to fix it all yourself, you'll justify anything. Right? When you're just trying to do it on your own strength, you're like, no, that's fine. I'll give in to the temptation. And so he brings Uriah home. So what? Temptation leads to desire. Desire leads to sin. And sin leads to death. If you're taking notes, that's what you can write down. Temptation 
if not dealt with, we'll turn to desire. Desire, if not dealt with, what's that? Derise. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Whoops. Desire. I do know how to spell. I just don't, I forget when up here. Sin, and then sin leads to death. Now, I'm not saying this to scare anybody here, all right? But I want us to see David's tempted by the woman when he should have been at battle. How many things in our life start with temptations because we're just bored? Can I be real? I don't know why I asked that. I talk to people all the time and they come to me. I, I have this sin issue in my life and I have this sin issue in my life. And we all do, right? Like I go to people and say, help me with this, please. Help me to stop eating pie. You know, like, or, or, or deeper rooted things, right? But you know, the root of every, everything that these temptations that come from, I, I always tell people, man, a lot of the temptation is because you're sitting there dwelling on the temptation. Go out and do something good for somebody else. Get, get off of your computer. Okay. But if you don't, then it turns to a desire. And then that desire, you know that desire when you want something and you will figure out how to get it, right? And see, if you're in this pattern, you're probably not in a pattern of seeking God with your life. You're probably seeking self. And so your desire is not a desire for God to say, God, please let me not be tempted. Because if you turned it to that, God would provide a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has seized you except what's common to man. But God is faithful. And when, he, when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out for you. The problem is we take our temptation and we turn it to our own desire. And then our desire gives birth to sin. No one will find out. And then David gets in this place where he's deep in sin because now he's got to figure out how do I make this right? And so Uriah comes to him and he gets him drunk because that's, you know, that's a good idea, right? I'll, I'll get him drunk and then he'll go home and sleep with his wife. I don't know, that man must not have had a wife because I don't know any guys who are like, my wife just loves, okay, anyway, so. But I'll just, we'll, we'll get him toasted and then his wife will be so excited that he's home. And this man has been made drunk by the king and has so much respect for that same king who's literally trying to ruin his life that he sleeps at his gate and says, I can't go out there. I can't do that. So now David's like, oh, shoot. You know what's crazy about this pattern and this cycle is that at any of these moments, all we have to do is say, God, I screwed up. Please forgive me. See, I think sometimes when we deal with sin, we deal with sin so much. Sin becomes the, the focus of our life. Like everything in our life is about sin and Lord, please help me not to sin and I don't, I don't want to sin anymore and I, I, because all you're doing is dwelling on the sin and trying to figure it out on your own again when all you need to do is turn to Jesus and say, God, I messed up bad, but will you fix this? And then he says, I'll provide a way out for you. But when you don't, you devise more sin. And David, ultimately, his sin led to the death of Uriah. If you keep reading in 2 Samuel, the sin also led to the death of his child that he had with Bathsheba. And then a prophet, Nathaniel, comes and rebukes David and says, what have you done? And it's this huge, long process, a part of David's story. And here is here my heart in this. It still did not change the fact that David was a man after God's own heart. It didn't change the fact that David was the king. It didn't change his destiny, but it sure did impact him along the way. And that's what happens with sin in our life. When we let sin take root and it leads to death, We can't resurrect the thing that we got rid of. David fasted and prayed for seven days after his child died and repentance and cried out to God. In fact, if you read Psalm 51, he's like, have mercy on me, oh God. Have mercy on me. Why? Because he finally realized that he let the pattern of temptation to desire, to sin, to death win. I started out this morning saying that the goal for today is to talk about to choose or not choose sin. I know at times we can fall into sin and not even realize we're in a place where we're just choosing everything apart from God. I refuse to stand up here and call out sin, by the way. So some of you are sitting there going, oh Lord, he's going to start now. 
Okay, I need all these people here and these people here and these. No, 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 no. You need the Holy Spirit in your life to be talking to you about what is sin. Paul says some things are permissible and others aren't for other people. What is he saying in that? There's some things when it comes to sin that God will give you the grace to do that he won't give me the grace to do. There's some things when it comes to, to, to obligations or ways you live your life or certain people that choose different things or whatever that God might say, that's not right for you because I'm calling you to a higher standard but doesn't convict that other person of that maybe for 10 or 20 or 30 years. I don't know where you are on your journey with God. I don't know what place in your life you could say, man, right now I'm in a place where I am choosing everything but God. Hear my heart when I say, You need to repent of the sin before it turns into death. That's some heavy stuff. I'm not saying your death. I'm not saying you're going to die. But you know what? If you're like me, you got a whole lot of dreams. And I watch leader after leader that have dreams and vision and so much on their life they want to do. And then one circumstance They choose sin, and the dream has to die because they can't get it back. Not that God can't restore their life and do something else with it, but that particular thing has to die because you can't get it back. And so my heart for us this morning as a church, we're in the series, Whatever It Takes. And I was thinking through this this week, and I wasn't planning on doing this message for this series, but then on the way to church this morning, it's cool how God works, and you got to be listening to the Holy Spirit because he'll... He'll do crazy things and tell you weird things, you know, and you're just, when it first started for me, I was just like, I, I, I don't want to hear God because this is weird, right? Because God is weird apparently because he has you interrupt services, right? Like he has you change songs. He, he has you change messages. Like if I told you every time that I had to change a message when I got up here, you'd think I was bipolar. <laughs> Maybe I am, I don't know. But, but when you're listening to the Holy Spirit and you start feeling a leaning towards something. This week, I just felt this. We talked last week about pushing into God's presence. And maybe some of you can't push into his presence because you're pushing into your own desire and giving birth to sin. And the problem is that sin, when it grows all the way, it's going to give birth to death. Sin does not grow up for you to be like, oh, yeah, that's a cool sin. Yo! Right? If you've been in here and you've overcome sin or you've overcome addictions or you've overcome things in your life that you've just been like, that thing had me in so much bondage, the freedom came when that thing was gone, right? The freedom didn't come when that thing grew up and you're like, hey, hey, hey now, I, now I got this one down. No, you have to let go of it. You have to surrender it like we sang about this morning. You have to lay it down before God and say, God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner, And your word says that for the wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they are justified freely by his grace. I don't want us to leave here depressed this morning. I want us to leave here lighter to realize that if I'm in this pattern, I don't know if you are or not, but if I'm in this pattern, what I need to do is come with a great big, I wish I had a red marker, that was like a great big stamp that just says paid in full. Paid in full full Jesus. Because see, you can sit around and try to get counseling to figure out why you keep going back to that pattern. And I think sometimes that's good because it teaches you how to choose different patterns in your life. But at the end of it all, what matters is when you just give it up and say, God, today is a new day and I'm going to start over. And from this day forward, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing good. I'm choosing to follow you. Excuse me, follow you. And I'm not choosing to continue to give into my temptation and give into my desire and give into my sin and then see Uriah die. I'm choosing life. I was looking up last night. I typed into Google, what is the opposite of sin? And there's actually not a word in the English language that means like the opposite of sin. But one of the things I was reading said that virtue is a great opposite word of sin. 
if you look at the life of someone who lives full of sin and just darkness and they're just always just like bound up and they never can get free and they never feel like anything ever works out and you contrast that to someone who lives a life of virtue. That's the kind of life I want to live. And that's the kind of life that I want you guys to live because if we ever want to do whatever it takes to build the church and restore the world, it's going to be a whole lot easier if we're people who say, I'm turning my back on sin. I'm not saying that you can't have sin in your life and still serve in ministry. I'm not saying that, that if you have sin that there's not a place for you. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this is for you. This is for you to be free. Because if you are free and you let Christ set you free and you let Jesus come and stamp it with paid in full by just surrendering to him and saying, God, forgive me for this area in my life, then you can live lighter. You can live fuller and you can live in a place of freedom where you can hear the voice of God greater in your life. It took David months to get back to that place. But we live on this side of the cross where it can happen in an instant. All you have to do this morning is repent. And in, the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, he remembers your sins no more. How cool is that? God, I'm sorry for this situation. God, I'm sorry that I handled this wrong. God, I'm sorry for, for this blatant sin where I just totally did this, whatever it is. When you repent, he doesn't even remember it anymore. So tomorrow morning when you get up and the enemy is like, well, you're never going to fully live in your destiny because I know what you did. Be like, huh, shut up, devil. God doesn't even know what you're talking about. He doesn't even remember it. The God of the universe doesn't remember it, so why am I remembering what I did wrong? Step into that grace today by repenting. Will you stand with me this morning? I want to ask you a question as we close this morning. Would you say in my life this morning that there's something that I need to repent of? Will you just shoot your hand up? You're like, that's me. My hand's with you. I had my pie yesterday. It's not just about pie. I just use that one because I don't want to get myself in trouble. I like sleeping in the bed with my wife, not on the couch. Amen. But you would say, hey, God, there's something in my life that I know I got to work on, but I, I don't even want to say that. Not I got to work on. There's something in my life that I need you to take, and I need you to set free, and I need you to put your blood on. So let's we'll keep your hands raised. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you in this place for every hand that's raised that says, hey, there's some sin in my life that I need you to deal with, Jesus. Father, I pray right now that through each of our lives that you would begin to speak to our hearts and our minds and, and, and show us places in our life where we've been dabbling in darkness or dabbling in sin or trying to choose sin over choosing life and choosing virtue. I pray this morning, God, that as we repent and we just say, God, we are so sorry that we didn't choose you. We're so sorry that we didn't choose the way that you have prepared for us. We're so sorry we didn't choose the way that you set the course for us. We repent this morning of a, of, of a, a mindset and a lifestyle that said we have to work it out on our own, that we can fix it, God. We know we can't fix it, only you can fix it. So I pray, Holy Spirit, this morning that you would come and touch every single person here, that you would free them from your sin. I ask that your blood would flow from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes, God, and they would pu be purified of the sin in their life, God, that they would leave here lighter, they would leave here wholer, and they would leave here free from sin, God. And every time the enemy comes to remind us of it, I pray this morning that we'd remind him that God doesn't even remember it. And I pray that even when he comes and tries to tempt us with new things like he wants to every day of our life, that when that temptation comes, we would immediately take our mind to say, okay, if I'm tempted, then I'm not letting that temptation lead me to desire that will lead me to sin. I'm gonna repent in that moment and say, God, give me freedom from this right now so I can continue to live free. So I just speak freedom over every single person here this morning, freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from desire. And I thank you, God, that your word says that when we are tempted, you will provide a way out. So give us the way out, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, and amen. If you're thankful for forgiveness this morning, will you put your hands together and thank God?